I want to do something a little different today. I want to make a reaction video to this article, The Liberal Arts by Themselves Will Not Save Democracy, But Teaching Them More Effectively Might. This is an article that I think is near and dear to my heart and my thinking. I have not actually read it yet. I have seen a few posts by the author Josh Eiler uh, on Twitter. I think I agree with the thesis. I at least agree with the title, but I have not read this yet. I just want to record my raw reactions, offer any kind of commentary I can, and just try to engage in this conversation. Um, let me say at the outset that this title is something that I have frequently tried to communicate to my colleagues outside of the STEM world. Um, I'm sure if you've been around the internet for any longer than about a day, you know that there's a little bit of a sore spot between the liberal arts and the STEM fields with the rise in popularity of STEM. Uh, I have never seen the popularity in STEM, certainly not the popularity of physics, as being competing with the liberal arts. I have always seen it as competing with uh, more pragmatic oriented programs like uh, like business, like healthcare, those 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 programs where the name of the major is the name of the job that you're looking for. In my mind, uh, the 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 core academic fields need to be a bit more competitive with those and need to start recruiting some of those students because honestly, I hear way too often from business majors who say, well, it didn't matter what I majored in, so I just majored in business. Um, as a Christian, I'm especially disheartened when I hear that from, uh, from folks going into seminary or from actively practicing pastors who say it didn't matter what I majored in, so I majored in business. Like, seriously, like, like that's the preparation you want for leading God's people is, is a business degree? Seriously? Um, and you're telling me that, that all these other fields that are part of creation, you're not interested in in the slightest? So I have never seen the rise in popularity of STEM as being a detriment to our colleagues over in the liberal arts. I have always seen it as trying to persuade some, not all, but some of the folks in the professional majors to pursue something more in line with their interests, right? I have I have never tried to take a take an English major or philosophy major and steal them away to physics. Anyway, this is what I have been trying to communicate with those colleagues is that the reason students leave the liberal arts and go to STEM is not because we're trying to steal them away or because we think STEM is inherently better. It's because we have invested decades now improving the ways that we teach STEM. And I'm not aware of a corresponding movement over on the liberal arts side of the house. It probably, there probably is some of it to some degree, but I don't see a lot of it. And a lot of the liberal arts educators I'm familiar with and that I'm close to think that quality teaching is just giving a better lecture or making the students read more. So anyway, all that to say, I was very excited to see this title uh, and I would like to go through and see my thoughts on this blog post. Okay, we start out with a quote from Paolo Freire. Freire? If I were more educated in the liberal arts, I might know how to pronounce it. Uh, in the banking concept of education, knowledge is a gift bestowed by those who consider themselves knowledgeable upon those whom they consider to know nothing. Yes, this is the fundamental problem in traditional lecture format. And honestly, it's the attitude that a lot of our students perceive in their liberal arts classes is that the professor knows something they do not, and the professor has to make a deposit. It is not surprising that the banking concept of education regards people, I assume we mean here, as adaptable, manageable beings. The more students work at storing the deposits entrusted to them, the less they develop the critical consciousness, which would result from their intervention in the world as transformers of that world. The more completely they accept the passive role imposed on them, the more they tend simply to adapt to the world as it is and to the fragmented view of reality deposited in them. 
The capability of banking education to minimize or annul the student's creative power and to stimulate their credulity serves the interests of the oppressors who care neither to have the world revealed nor to see it transformed. Hmm, that is good. That is good. Pedagogy of the oppressed. Okay. Uh, yeah, so in the days since January 6th, violent insurrection in the Capitol, higher ed has been puzzling over its role in preventing disasters like this from happening in the future. Because of the fundamental role played by conspiracy theories and misinformation in radicalizing the mob that threaten the cradle of American democracy, some have posited that we need help. Do we need to help students develop better critical thinking skills? Okay, I totally agree with that statement. The, like, I, I don't understand how on the one hand you can say that you believe in absolute truth and that only absolute truth counts and that... Anybody who disagrees with you disagrees with absolute truth that you're also okay with people running around spreading conspiracy theories. Like, I don't get it. Like, that to me is the ultimate lack of critical thinking is if you have an absolute truth in one hand and you have conspiracy theories in the other, those do not fit together, right? That's, that's the very basis of critical thinking is recognizing when two ideas do not mesh, right? And that is part of what we try to teach in STEM is that you have a model, you have data, how well do those two match together? And we're learning that that is a thing we have to explicitly teach. All right, uh, so definitely, yeah, I agree with that. We, we, we need to help students develop better critical thinking skills. Others have suggested that more exposure to the humanities or the liberal arts more generally is necessary to give students historical context, to train them to navigate nuance and ambiguity, to assess competing sources, to cultivate empathy, to highlight the importance of diverse perspectives. Okay, I always make it a point to ask my students what they learn in their other courses, especially stuff in the core curriculum that's, that's, that's not inside my field, that's not even inside my, my sphere of knowledge. I always ask them, what are you learning in that course? Because I want to know and I want to be able to make connections with them in the classroom and I want to try to link it to what we're learning in the physics class. I, I, I have asked every one of my junior and senior physics majors, what are you learning in your humanities course? They don't mention any of this. They tell me that it basically is a repeat of their art history class, right? They don't mention learning historical context. They don't mention navigating nuance and ambiguity. They definitely don't mention assessing competing sources. And uh, empathy and diverse perspectives, they don't mention. I certainly hope they learn it. I mean, I hope they learn all this stuff. I, this is all good stuff. I've never heard a student refer to any of this while they're in a humanities course. As someone who has been trained in the humanities and who leads a critical thinking initiative at my university, good for you, I am sympathetic to these claims. But I also think they weren't a closer look. Certainly all of these ideas have the potential to be true. I'm seeing two disconnects. I'm seeing a disconnect between the liberal arts education that promises to teach this stuff and whether students are actually learning that stuff, right? So there's a disconnect between the curriculum and what the students are learning. And then there's a disconnect between what the students are learning and whether they're willing to allow that to actually impact their view of the world and how they act in the world, right? That's right. One is, are you teaching what's in your syllabus, right? That's the thing I have a pretty good amount of control over. But the second, going from what the students learn to what the students value and do with their lives, that's a whole nother ball game. That is another challenge. I mean, I teach students how to give presentations and most of them throw out what they learn after they get done with my class because they think that's what Dr. Lane wanted me to do. That's not really important. I mean, teaching the value of that, that's, that's a problem I don't think any of us has solved in education. Okay, we cannot, in other words, rest on the laurels of the mere possibilities presented by these disciplines. Here, 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 here. We must do the work of teaching them effectively for them to have any effect whatsoever on our civic life. Okay, so I think he's getting at both of those gaps that I was thinking at. He's definitely getting at the gap of are you teaching what you are purporting to be important? And then is your teaching more likely to affect students' sense of value of what they're learning? I think that's what he's saying here. We must do the work of teaching them effectively for them to have any effect whatsoever on our civic life. Yes. Yes, absolutely. 
absolutely. We and, and it is work to teach effectively. It is not simply a matter of, well, I'm going to try to lecture better next semester. It is. So let me, I don't think I've ever talked about this on the channel, but my approach to teaching effectively is that I try to make a modification to each of my classes each semester, right? I try to never teach a class exactly the same way twice. That doesn't mean that I burn it all to the ground every semester, but it does mean that if there's if there's one assignment, if there's one assignment in week seven that's not working, I'm going to take out that assignment and try something else, right? That's a minor change, right? That's just changing one worksheet. Or it might be that I want to try a new assignment type. Maybe I want to try to change up how I do my warm-up assignments. Or maybe I want to count in class participation differently, right? Those are minor changes. But about every five years, I basically deconstruct my entire course and then rebuild it. Because eventually you make so many modifications, they don't quite fit together and they're not quite, you know, in sync with each other. And so about every five years, I just delete the syllabus start over with a blank document and rebuild it from scratch using only the stuff that I know worked from the last five years. And so it's hard work. Like, like what he's talking about here, I recognize is very hard work. And not all of us have the time to do that. But if we're not willing to do it at some point in our careers, why are we in education? Why not just go work at a library or a lab? You know, it is not enough uh, to teach only through what Paolo Freire called the banking model of education. That is an approach to teaching where faculty provide or deposit, if we're following the metaphor, information and students withdraw this information for exams. Yes, yes, because goodness knows that don't happen anyway, right? In this model, teaching and learning are purely transactional. There is no room for the kind of engagement with difficult, complex ideas that would allow a student to develop the kinds of skills that would allow them to assess competing narratives and to commit to ethical purposes and democratic ideals. Yes. So this is one of the things I had to learn to do in my syllabus and in my course planning is that it's not enough to plan to cover, hate that word, it's not enough to cover certain topics. You also have to look at the skills you're developing in the students. And a skill is not something you can deposit. Don't get me wrong. You can't deposit and withdraw concepts either. Those require practice. But a skill you definitely can't. A skill you only get from practice. And students aren't practicing in a class where they take notes in lecture and then regurgitate those notes on the exam. There are no skills involved in that. And there really isn't that much content transfer either. So I like this. I like this so far. Indeed, Freire notes in the passage I use as an epigram above that such teaching runs counter to the cultivation of democracy because it envisions students as mere receptacles and instruments of oppressive idolatries. Excuse me, ideologies. Idolatries are oppressive too, don't get me wrong. Okay, so then what do we need to envision students as? What, because in my mind, democracy is about everybody participating, right? At, at the bare minimum, democracy means we all get a vote and that that vote counts equally for everyone, regardless of where they live or how much land they are surrounded by. But that's, I mean, voting is really the bare minimum of democracy, right? So in my mind, democracy is where everybody is participating in creating the culture. You know, we, we really need a world where we all feel empowered and welcomed to help shape the culture around us, right? And we don't all feel that way right now in the U.S. So, yeah, so... That's, that's what I want to envision, but I, 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 I want him to write another sentence here to say, instead, we should view students as blank. So I'm hoping he gets to that, because I would love a counter to receptacles and instruments. Rather than focusing on rote memorization and deposits of information, then we need to give students in the liberal arts ample opportunities to wrestle with ambiguity. Yes, this is the thing that folks who are stuck on lecture do not understand is that your students need an opportunity to do something in front of you and that means you gotta shut up at some point right at some point you gotta let there be silence in the classroom so the students can actually do something to use primary sources as a way to make sense of nuanced issues to tackle questions that have no easy answers or no established answers at all this is what we do in computation Right? Because we want students to be able to get to the stuff without 
an analytical solution. I know he's talking about an entirely other level within society, but computation is a good way to practice not having an answer at the back of the book. And most importantly, to offer their own interpretations of these ideas by marshalling evidence that have they have credibly evaluated. Okay, so what are they then? Right? Because they're definitely not receptacles and instruments in this paragraph, but what are they? What is the noun that I need to have in mind that I envision students as blank? What goes in that blank there? Because if I could have a noun for that blank, that would be the foundation from which everything else spreads. Okay, I'm, I'm mixing metaphors there. That would be the epicenter from which pedagogical reform would spread. So I need I need a blank there. I need a I need a fill in the blank of instead of receptacle, students are blank. Here's an example. Good. A student in an introductory American history course. Boy, talk about a course where you're expected to ingest information and regurgitate it. I mean really. Literally a bunch of dates is my perception of history. I know that's not how historians see it, but you need to teach the course in the way that you perceive it so that the students will see why it's interesting. Otherwise, just a list of dates. All right. May hear in a lecture that FDR signed an order to establish internment camps for Japanese Americans, but without further engagement with the subject, it would be easy for that same student to adapt this information into the mental model they already have about FDR being a highly regarded president. Okay, I like this sentence. Talking about mental models, that's something we have in physics. I don't know that that's something we talk about in a history class. I certainly never heard models mentioned in any of the history classes I took. And the thing is, that's a plausible statement. That, that is an entirely possible statement, but they have no means of evaluating it, right? And so if it's a plausible statement that reinforces your worldview, you're going to tend to accept it, right? Without exploring the primary sources for themselves is shorter and more inclusive. A student can easily fall back on defense mechanisms for this model and focus more on the information about FDR that confirms their existing impression of him. Okay, good, good, good. Here's another. Remember Washington Irvin's short story, Rip Van Winkle? Nope, I can honestly say I don't remember a single short story I read because I read it, I wrote a report, and it was gone. The plot of the story is pretty well known. Old Rip falls asleep one day, and when he wakes up, he realizes that decades have passed away. This is true, but reading the story itself reveals a complex political allegory about the American Revolution. Yeah, no, I didn't get that. I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't get it. Because they didn't teach us how to extract allegory, right? That is a skill that I was not given opportunity to practice. Right. And I, you know what I, and, and the thing is, I understand if, if you're getting into allegory stuff for the first time with a, let's say fifth grader and you want to feed them, here is the story, here is the meaning, here's the story, here's the meaning. Yeah, sure. Go for it. Cause they probably don't have that reasoning center quite fully developed yet anyway. But by the time you're a college junior, I think it's about time to entrust that student, that junior with the ability to extract the allegory. I mean, I, 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 that's the thing. At what point in liberal arts education do the training wheels come off? Because in STEM, we try to get those training wheels off as soon as possible because we want the students thinking independently. We want the students going on to their own investigations and discovering stuff, even if it's already been known for 500 years. Yeah, they can go ahead and discover it too but also because ultimately we want to invite them into our community. Like in, in STEM, I, I think many of us have the attitude that we are training future STEM people. Even in a physics for poets class, we're trying to train them, right? Because maybe I can persuade them to pick up a physics minor, or maybe I can persuade them to do one little extra project and get it published in the physics teacher. I mean, ultimately, we, we are trying to apprentice these students. I can honestly say I don't think I ever felt apprenticed in a humanities liberal arts uh, class. All right. The pub that Rip frequents before he falls asleep has a picture of King George III on it. Okay. After he awakens, the sign is repurposed to feature George Washington without changing much at all. Likewise, he finds the people of his town relatively unchanged, except for the aging that has happened. It raises important questions about the impact of the American Revolution on the everyday lives of people in small towns, about how much it really changed their viewpoints. Okay, you know what? I get that point. 
I really do get that point, but do you know why I get that point? Is because they made it in Game of Thrones, right? So uh, what's his name? Uh, I don't remember. The guy who was also on Downton Abbey says to Callie C., you know, Callie C. says, the people of Westeros are praying for my return. And he says, Callie C., the people are praying for short winters and pleasant summers. Like, they're not praying for a queen to come deliver them. They don't care who the king or queen is because it's not going to change their everyday lives. And it really drives home the fact that, that A Song of Ice and Fire is not a story about the people. It's a story about the noble. But the thing is, the thing that gets me about the statement is that I got that better from a fantasy book series that I didn't even finish reading or watching because it kind of grew disgusting on me. I understand that better than some great piece of literature that's being cited here because it was interesting and because I was invited into it and because there was excitement and hype about it. It wasn't a thing that you are reading so that you can pass a test later. So students need to be given the opportunity to think through these shades of gray meaningfully. Yes, I think much more meaningfully about Game of Thrones and Wheel of Time and even book series I haven't read. Like, I haven't read any Harry Potter, but I know who the good guys and the bad guys are. I know what the general idea is. I can carry on a conversation about it. The novels that I read in high school, I could not tell you anything about because I was not given an opportunity to think through their shades of gray, whatever, meaningfully. Though, if they are going to challenge their pre-existing ideas about American history and about our democracy and to realize that literature, art, and music, and theater have always been the sites of resistance and competing narratives. Well, that was a lot in one sentence that, like, I mean, you could make that the, 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 the learning goal of your American history course and teach a pretty good class. In short, the role of the liberal arts in helping to maintain and bolster a healthy democracy is substantial, but only if they are taught well. We need to place much more attention on effective teaching practices, both the K-12 through and college level, so that we can ensure students know how to ask the right questions, to challenge conspiracy theories by marshalling evidence, and to advance our collective purpose through seeing our institutions continually through new lenses. Okay, this is a great article. This raises the point that I tried diplomatically to bring up with my uh, liberal arts colleagues, and it did not always work. But here's my question. I mean, I... I don't know. I feel like this is a bit short. I'll be honest. I, I feel like there's no call to action. Like there's no go to this article and read about these teaching practices. There's not even an example of effective teaching practices. Like it's, it's a good um, outline of the goals, right? So this is a great outline of what the goals are, great outline of what the goals are, but there's no mention of what an example of engaged learning is because if 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 i'm if i'm a if i'm a humanitist and i read this and i'm in love with my lecture and i have the model that lectures the best i might read this and say oh yeah i need to go lecture better this that's not enough you you have to take the lecture you have to throw it out you have to build up all the other stuff and then when there's a gap that you say oh wait i need to tell the students about this you take that lecture you cram it into 10 minutes you know like i i i I feel like this needs a follow-up with something more pointed to say, check out clicker questions, check out small group whiteboarding. God, I would love to do some small group whiteboarding in an English composition class. I mean, could you imagine if you come into your freshman composition class and the, the, the chairs are all at pods of like three or four students and you have a giant whiteboard in the middle and the professor tells you to outline your next Let's say you're still writing essays, but please find something better than essays to outline your next essay on the whiteboards. I mean, my gosh, that one change would be enormous. And, and this, would be, this would be my ultimate call to action for the humanities side of the house. We know this stuff in STEM. We know that it's working and we know that it's growing in popularity because we do the research for it, because we study how students learn, we study how faculty adopt new pedagogical strategies, we study how effective this stuff is in our classes. Please, if there is an equivalent side on humanities for education research within the discipline, I would love to see it, and I will gladly amend this video to point to those resources, but I haven't seen them. And when I mention them to humanities folks, they have no idea what I'm talking about and they seem to not even want it. But you know what, y'all? If you want students 
to learn more in your classes, you got to do the research about it. You have to be willing to learn from them. You have to be willing to enter their headspaces and find out what is working and not working, and then adjust your curriculum accordingly. And you know what? It's going to take a long time. It's going to take decades. We're probably going to have another January 6th before the humanity side of the house gets this thing figured out. Let's just be honest. But what I would like to see, what I would like to see come out of this thinking is a willingness to experiment and evaluate and revise. That's really all it comes down to, right? Try something new. I don't even care if it sounds like a good idea. The, the research shows that the worst engaged learning courses produce better learning than the best lecture-based courses. So even if you try something and it feels like a total failure, chances are, statistically speaking, your students are learning more than they did in your lecture-based course. So try something out. Then evaluate it, right? You have to identify what it is you want the students to learn, and you have to be able to evaluate whether you've had a positive impact on that thing, on that learning objective. And then go and revise, right? You, you, you don't have to keep trying something that's not working. You can go back and tweak it, or you can throw it out and try something new. But, okay, well, there's my reaction to the liberal arts by themselves will not save democracy, but teach them more effectively. My written very well uh, by Josh Eiler. Josh, thank you for uh, contributing that to the discussion. I hope that your colleagues over on the liberal arts side of the house uh, take it to heart and take up that challenge. I really do. If you've got thoughts on how we might implement some engaged learning pedagogy in uh, humanities, history, literature, composition courses, things like that, please would love to get to discuss that with you in the comments below. If there is a major, you know, humanities education research and reform movement going on, please let me know. I would love to follow it. I would love to send that along to people that I know that, that teach in the liberal arts. Uh, would, I, I would just absolutely love to, to see that come up. Thank you so much for watching, listening to this rambling. I will see you next time. Bye-bye.